friends uh, good morning good afternoon good evening to all of you can you all hear me yes yes okay so uh, it's uh, such a joy for me to uh, welcome each and every one of you who have joined this uh, afternoon to uh, join this new testament scholars meet uh, online lecture by professor uh, mitzi j smith and uh, it is yeah um friends we have uh, professor mitzi j smith joining from uh, georgia um and uh, Uh, this is the fir first uh, online lecture organized by New Testament Scholars Meet of uh, Ecclesia Center for Biblical Research and Pastoral Accompaniment. Uh, friends, uh, it's good to have all of you here with us um, to introduce uh, Mitzi. Reverend Dr. Mitzi J. Smith is the J. Davison Phillips Professor of New Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia. She is one of the three black women biblical scholars in the USA with an endowed chair. Before accepting the call to teaching at Columbia Theological Seminary, Dr. Smith taught NT New Testament and Black Church Studies at Ashland Theological Seminary. for 13 years she is the first Amer african american woman to earn a phd in new testament from harvard university she also earned a md from harvard university school of divinity and a ma in black studies from the ohio state university dr smith has published six books and many essays and articles her latest two books are decentering the new testament and woman is has and back talk uh, social injustice intersectionality and biblical interpretation smith's new co-edited volume with uh, jin yong choi minor minorized women reading race and ethnicity will be published in july 2020 uh, we have a very eminent uh, new testament scholar to share her expertise on the radical politics of womanist interpretation with us uh, mitsi we are very grateful to you especially on behalf of ecclesia center for biblical research and pastoral accompaniment i would like to uh, express my sincere thanks and love for accepting to share your um, research with us on the topic the radical politics of womanist interpretation Uh, over to Dr. Mitzi Smith. Thank you so much, teacher. So great to be with you all. Good to see you again uh, in the somewhat in the flesh, and 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 Dr. Rohan and and the rest, uh, Gideon and the rest of you. Uh, I should say good evening to you, but good morning to me. Uh, you've you've uh, made me get up earlier than I've had to <laughs> this summer, <laughs> but I'm glad to do it. So I'm very glad to be with you. Um, so I want to talk about the radical politics of womanist interpretation. Uh, I've been doing a series of womanist uh, Zoom dialogues and recorded them for YouTube. Uh, in a recent one, I was reminded by Dr. Monica Coleman, who's a theologian, about how radical it is to center Black women's experiences. Um, so if we think about the uh, academy in the United States of America, uh, black black scholars in Bible are uh, less than six percent. So you can imagine that black women in Bible are less than they are less than four percent of the uh, scholars in the U.S. 
Uh, so we are still talking about not only a dominant white male, and somebody reminded me, an uh, older white male, um, um, uh, 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 Academy of Scholars, um, we are talking about also a Eurocentric, a dominant Eurocentric approach that centers uh, white male voices and experiences and culture. Whiteness is not without culture, uh, but it parades as if it is. Uh, so uh, the radicalness of womanist interpretation, uh, uh, particularly for me, is to center, to center black women's voices, black women's concerns, black women's artifacts, Black women's uh, ways of reading, epistemologies, that is, ways of knowing, um, and not privileging uh, the Bible, uh, but uh, recognizing uh, that this human flesh that God has given us, this life God has given us, is as sacred, if not more sacred than a text. Uh, and this is uh, part of the problem uh, of uh, what we are fighting for here in the U.S. in terms of Black Lives Matter. Um, a lot of the support um, of, of um, a lot of what undergirds and, and really uh, where racism originated was this, this marriage between Christianity uh, and capitalism. Um, so, uh, so to do what I do is to um, reaffirm that Black people's lives are sacred and even more sacred than a text or as sacred as any inspired or other sacred text. And life, of course, is more sacred than a text. So, um, of of course, as well, we, we know, and probably all over the world, anybody who has been trained as a biblical scholar, uh, unfortunately, we are trained uh, uh, to believe that exegesis is king, right? That exegesis is king. And to do exegesis, we are taught to marginalize, right, our own experience, as if we are coming to the Bible as blank slates, Reading the Bible as blank slates, and we are to believe that white male scholars are reading the Bible as blank slates. They are not. And so we are taught to look for, first and foremost, historical origins and to marginalize our own experiences and our own selves as sacred texts that God has created. Uh, so we talk about usually about applying, uh, and I, I detest I detest that language now. Doing we talk about doing it to Jesus and then applying it to a contemporary context. And I would think that that God um, probably um, sort of quivers as much as I do when when God hears that. I like to think as if our lives and what, what we are going through is a second thought to God as well. So um, uh, a question that arose recently, I was doing a, an interview with the Wabash Center for Religion, for, for Theological uh, Learning. And uh, one of the questions that was presented, which always comes up when, when uh, non-white people are doing biblical interpretation, uh, and it always comes up when we are um, uh, openly, overtly engaging our culture, is, uh, so how do you guard against anything goes? As if doing uh, exegesis um, uh, uh, is a safeguard against, or ever has been a safeguard against the dominant culture abusing the text. It never has been. Right, so I refuse, I refuse to offer any kind of defense in doing what I am doing. Uh, I, re I refuse to be put on the defensive, right? Uh, so, um, uh, so I don't think we can ever guard against uh, our biases, whether they're good or bad, right? 
but we can try to be conscious of them. I don't care how we're approaching the text, whether we claim to be approaching it as exegesis. In, in, my, in my view, uh, exegesis probably is more violent than any, any process because it says to people of color, your lives, what you're going through does not matter, it's secondary. And to me, that is, that is an act of violence. And we are taught, we are taught to do that. And, you know, my years of teaching, it took me maybe my sixth or seventh year of teaching. Uh, uh, every year, my department, which was primarily uh, white uh, in, um, uh, when I was at Ashland, uh, was every year having these sessions about how to better teach exegesis because we were failing. Well, the reason why we're failing is because there's a problem with the method, right? Uh, I, I'm grateful now, very interesting, at Columbia Theological Seminary, the only two people teaching New Testament at Columbia right now are people of color. That is Dr. Raj Nadella and myself, right? Uh, an Indian scholar and an African-American scholar make up the New Testament department at Columbia Theological Center. And I, there's probably, there may not be, except at a historically black school, there's probably not, a, not another New Testament department like that in the country right now. Uh, so, um, so I center uh, black women's uh, experiences, as I said, what issues we are dealing with. I start with our experience. Um, I'm always thinking about, you know, how can I, um, how can I give voice to what's going on in our communities? How can I give voice to injustices uh, uh, in the world, in our communities, and in our churches? Um, and how can I place uh, the text, which we regard as so sacred, in dialogue as well with uh, what is going on in our communities and in our churches and so forth? Uh, so what I want to do, because I believe I have uh, 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 Dr. Cheechum has given me a half an hour. Uh, what I thought I'd do uh, is to share with you uh, an essay that I, uh, 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 part of an essay, part of some research that I recently finished, and it, it, is, at the, it is in the process of being published now, and this may be, it may be, maybe, depend on your, 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 your point of view, this may be the most radical piece I've written, radical, and, and, and to me, radical uh, in, in the context in which I teach, um, and in the context in which I'm a biblical scholar, radical is a good thing. We need radical voices. We need radical departures from the status quo, from the status quo. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, during this time of the uh, Black Lives Matter and the, um, the mass marches and the consistent marches that are going on uh, despite the pandemic in the U.S., um, it's interesting that I have scholars now, white scholars now, trying to find out what black people have, have, have written and, 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 and how they can bring them into their classrooms. And, uh, so why, you know, why was that not important before? Will this be a fad for them, right? But it is not a fad for us, and I hope it, I hope it, I hope it will not be. I hope this is a turning point for at least part of the academy. Uh, we know probably the dominant part of the academy will dig its heels in and, and continue to insist upon a Eurocentric uh, um, um, approach to Bible. So, uh, this essay that I was asked to write will appear in a volume. Uh, the volume is coming out of the UK, out of uh, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, Jamie Reeves, and uh, I forget uh, her co-editor, is editing this volume entitled, When Did We See You Naked? When did, you, when did We See You Naked? Of course, that comes from Matthew where Jesus said, when did we see you naked and you clothed us, right? And so it is a response to the Me Too, Me Too movement. Uh, and uh, uh, it is a response, the, the volume is a response to the Me Too, Too movement. But of course, I'm always writing still uh, in the context of Black lives. 
And so the title of this essay that I recently finished, and I'm just going to uh, uh, share with you the introduction and, 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 uh, and, and a couple of major thoughts. Uh, so the title of the essay is Never, He Never Said a Mumbling Word, and that is from an African-American spiritual that is usually sung by not just African-Americans, all kinds of people across the U.S. and the world uh, sing this song at Easter, particularly around resurrection. He never said a mumbling word, right? And we know from scripture that that is not true, right? So uh, in the, the subtext of it is a womanist perspective of crucifixion, sexual violence, and sacralized silence. And I start with an epigraph, uh, a, a, a part of a poem called Theodicy, Theodicy by Joshua Bennett. And Joshua Bennett is an, an award-winning uh, young African-American poet. Uh, so this verse reads, why don't we grieve for women, for girls, the same way we do our men, our vanishing boys? And I encourage you to find that poem on the internet, The Odyssey. It's a, it's a wonderful poem. And he has a whole book of poems um, uh, uh, called the, the Sobbing School, The Sobbing School. So in this essay, I explore Jesus' crucifixion in the context of ancient Roman crucifixion and in comparison to the lynching of black men in the U.S. Particularly, I examine the relationship between crucifixion and lynching, sexual violence, and sacralized science, silence, that is, silence that is made sacred. What are the ethical implications, I ask, of viewing Jesus as a victim of sexual violence and for truth telling in faith communities? I am a survivor of child sexual abuse by my grandfather, a deacon in the Baptist church. The politics of church authority, family, age, and gender kept me silent about the abuse for many years. I was a 12-year-old girl, or so I thought, until a counselor asked me where was my younger sister when this happened. I answered, she had not yet been born. That meant I was actually eight years old in a Christian household where rumors that my grandfather raped my mother's younger sister were dismissed as lies. Their mother died when, she, when her children were all under five years old after relatives raised them and not my grandfather. In our home, advice about sex was gendered and biased. Keep your dress tail down, my mother often said. Sexual purity depended on a girl's ability to control the movement of the fabric on her body. Females carried and still carry the burden of male lust, the loss of sexual control and sexual abuse, victim blaming. In church, we learned that the age of accountability when things became our fault was 12, which was the age the precocious Jesus entered the temp temple and entered into grown-up talk with rabbis. Then there was the biblical mandate to touch not God's anointed and do him no harm imposed upon the majority female church membership. This mandate expressed itself in the following way. If a family member and or a church leader member sexually violates a woman, girl, boy, or man, we keep the secret lest we dismantle the family or damage the deacons or the church's reputation. We are socialized to bear the shame of sexual abuse and silence and to uncritically honor religious authorities and familial relationships. We are warned to let sleeping or dead dogs lie, unquote. What good could come from truth telling after the deacon, the grandfather is dead? 
Black women and their children, male and female, are taught that when men, because most perpetrators are men, but not only men, violate us, it is our fault and the abuse is manageable. Sexual violence, including coerced, forced nudity, harassment, unwelcome touching of bodies or genitalia, and penetration is traumatic. The recovery, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and physical is long and torturous, even with a trained, competent counselor. So what happens when you don't have a counselor? The unwillingness of family, church, community to believe survivors of sexual violence compounds the trauma and increases feelings of abandonment. Many victims self-medicate, engage in risky, harmful behaviors, and or commit suicide. In black churches, but not exclusively there, it is preached, sung, prayed, and taught that Jesus, God's Messiah, never spoke a mumbling word in his humiliation and suffering. He suffered abuse, torture, and an agonizing death in silence, the song goes. Christians claim the crucified Christ as the suffering servant of Isaiah who like a slaughtered lamb bore the violence inflicted upon him in silence. Verse 53 of Isaiah, uh, Trito Isaiah, uh, verse seven of chapter 53 of Trito Isaiah says, he was oppressed, then he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth, unquote. What parallels have Black Americans drawn between Jesus' crucifixion and the Black experience of oppression, particularly in the spiritual? He never said a mumbling word. As it is performed every Easter or Resurrection Sunday in most Black churches and at other occasions. More people attend church at Easter than any other time of the year. What is the impact of the ritualized performance of silent suffering on traumatized Black women, children, and men who sit in the pews? What was the content and extent of the in violence inflicted upon Jesus during the crucifixion? Did it include sexual violence? Do the Gospels or the New Testament narratives depict the crucified Jesus as silent? This essay explores these questions. I first discuss Black church literary and liturgical traditions that view the crucifixion of Jesus through the lens of Black suffering. I particularly focus on the African American spiritual. He never said a mumbling word and ask, what is the origin of the theological and hermeneutical underpinning that depicts the crucified Jesus as the silent suffering lamb? I think about that. None of the gospels depict Jesus as the silent suffering lamb. So where did this connection between Isaiah and Jesus's crucifixion come from? And in the essay, I explored that it came from, I look at the Gospels, then I see, you look at Acts chapter 8, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. It is so interesting that it, and it is there that we get this connection, this interconnection between the suffering servant and the, um, uh, and the crucifixion. He's reading Isaiah, and Philip comes along and says, you, you know, the person you're reading about is this crucified Jesus. And it's interesting because probably this um, eunuch was was um, castrated against his will, right? He is living a life of suffering. And Philip has just left Jerusalem after being a part because of the persecution that happened after Stephen. So two, these two individuals who have an experience of suffering, meet at this intersection, right? I never noticed this before, and it is there. These two suffering individuals that Peter, 
that Philip interprets the Isaiah song because probably because of their shared suffering. But we don't get that in the Gospels. It comes at that point. This African and this Hellenist Jewish man, right, is where we get this application of the suffering servant applied to Jesus. Second, I explored the passion stories and texts about Jesus' suffering and crucifixion, primarily, but not exclusively, in the Gospel of Mark and Acts, as I've just stated, Acts Chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And then finally in this essay, I discussed the lynching of black bodies, sexual violence, and the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and I am looking at information that's already out there. What can we know and imagine about Jesus' suffering and crucifixion in the New Testament when read in the, in the historical context of Roman crucifixion, right? Uh, crucifixion in antiquity was a gruesome public display of state-sanctioned violence inclusive of sexual abuse meant to instill terror that deterred other people from similar criminalized behaviors as the crucified ones. Uh, so when you look more closely at, at, at Roman crucifixion and people who have who have researched this, who have who are experts in it, and some of the archaeological inf uh, information, I, I didn't know before I started writing this piece that most crucified victims were slaves. Most crucified victims were slaves, and most crucifixions took place in the arena. It was a public spectacle. So I don't, I don't know how Jesus has got to Golgotha. I, I, I'm thinking that Christians later applied this story by saying it, it happened in Golgotha to take away some of the shame. And most crucified victims were, were crucified naked, right? So even if you think about in the Gospels, and I bring this out in the S, if you think about in the Gospels, the fact that Jesus is disrobed, um, and he's in this space with these, with these, these Roman guards. Do you really think that no uh, sexual abuse, whether it's touching or, or beating in certain areas, in, 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 in genitals or something, did not take place? Uh, so why is it that we want to talk about how shameful it is, but we find it shameful? to even imagine what most victims endured that Jesus did not. That we want to claim that he would not have endured the same type of shame. Crucifixion in antiquity was a gruesome public display of state-sanctioned violence, inclusive of sexual abuse, meant to instill terror that deterred other people from similar criminalized, whether they were criminals or not, the behavior was criminalized, the person was criminalized, like black folks, and just running from the police is, is, is considered um, a capital offense. Just being black in, in many spaces are considered a capital offense, so they're criminalized. The lynching of black men and women, and some white people have been lynched over the years, are similarly described. The Black Theology of James Cone assists in comparing the lynching of Black peoples with Christ's crucifixion as well. Cone states that, quote, artists and writers have made the lynching theme a dominant part of their work, and most have linked Black victims with the crucified Christ as a way of finding meaning in the repeated atrocities of African American communities, unquote. The black poet, County Colin, articulated the connection between the lynching of black people and the crucifixion of Christ in his 1922 poem, Crucified Christ. The South is crucifying Christ again. Lynch him, lynch him, oh savage cry. Why should you echo crucify, unquote. What is the significance of understanding Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse? abuse? and its implications for Black women as survivors of sexual violence in the Black community in general. 
Years of silence generally separate the rape or sexual violence from the survivor's truth telling for several re reasons, including power dynamics between perpetrator and victim, between perp uh, also victim blaming, the absence of a trusted person in which to confide as well. Thus, I argue that traditions, including sacred texts, authoritative, authoritative interpretations, and interpreters, and, church, and the authority of institutions, I would add, uh, ameliorate the traumatic and chronic impact of sexual violence on its victims and or that promote and sacralize, make sacred the silence or silencing of possible or proven victims of sexual uh, abuse. Uh, so it, make, it makes it difficult for it to be exposed and challenged. Further, many victims tell their truths because they know without truth telling, healing, and justice elude them. There is no healing, there is no justice without truth telling. In our modern context, sexual violence training teaches that when a child or adult presents or articulates that she or he has been sexually assaulted, the person being confided in has an obligation to report the possible abuse to the appropriate agency so that the matter can be investigated. And I would say in this volume, we are attempting to, uh, to also report the very possible sexual abuse of Jesus in his crucifixion. Expressions of disbelief are not appropriate and will cause the abused to shut down. Why do some of us respond with disbelief to the possibility that Jesus was sexually violated during crucifixion? Why do some take it personally, personally as an attack on his memory and as a shameful suggestion? And yet we to lift up the fact that crucifixion was shameful, that he bore our shame. Yet those same persons highlight the humiliation. Jesus' humiliation is tempered by our fears and our ideologies. In our imagination, Jesus is white and male. In the imaginary of white America, he cannot have been sexually violated and still be a white male. That type of, of abuse is reserved for black men and might constitute what Cornel West calls a niggerization of Jesus. What made ancient crucifixion so humiliating and disgraceful? A violent death is brutal and evil, as like Mel Brooks, uh, his cinematic spectacle uh, show, uh, uh, showed us. But that's not necessarily shameful. It's not shameful to be beat up. It is horrific. It is evil. But it is shameful in the, in the imaginary of most uh, people to be sexually abused. What or who is at stake that we feel the need to bury the very reasonable possibility that sexual abuse was a significant aspect of the shamefulness of crucifixion? Who or what do we protect by privileging silence? I propose that like the lynching of black men in America, Jesus' lynching on the cross was more likely than not accompanied by sexual abuse, even castration. It's interesting that there's a, I, I mentioned this uh, essay in this, uh, this article in my essay, um, um, of a story of a black man who survived lynching. I believe he's the only one in history to have survived. Uh, they thought he was dead, uh, but he survived, and only because at that time, uh, the, the sheriff at the time championed his story. And uh, when they found him, he was clothed. Think about Jesus and the story in the gospel. He was clothed. Um, but they just, what had happened, they discovered, is the men, the white men who lynched him, um, took his clothes off, beautifully um, castrated him, 
sexually violated him and put his clothes back on. Think about the gospel story of Jesus being unclothed and being reclothed, right? Because um, uh, to, to somewhat hide, right, the sexual violence of a white man against a black man. They were not supposed to survive to be able to tell the full story, but this man survived the story. So I hope uh, that this essay will empower victims of sexual violence, men and women, to realize the shame and silence of sexual violence is not theirs to bear. It is not ours to bear, but it has been hoisted upon our backs by people who fear certain truths above the freedom and wholeness that it offers its victims. So that is that is the introduction and in some of um, and, 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 and some of the in a summary of some of what appears in this essay. Uh, hopefully, it will be published. Um, uh, um, it has been peer reviewed twice, and hopefully, it will be published before the book will come out. You know, a lot of publishers are on furlough, editors are on furlough, but hopefully, this book will come out before the end of the year. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and and. Uh, uh, for questions. Or comments. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Dr. Mitzi. Uh, as you have mentioned, it's the most uh, radical piece of research that you have done. And at least as I have listened to you uh, many times before, I found this uh, truly radical and I could see how you bring yourself as the reader or the interpreter to the text and relate the lives of uh, black americans and to the life i mean the narratives of the bible um, it is truly truly radical that you have raised this question where is jesus silence mentioned in the gospels or at the time of crucifixion mm -hmm. and you have also you were very radical in uh, raising uh, this possibility of most slaves, uh, those who were crucified, could be naked. And um, the way you have been radical in connecting the lynching of black men to lynching of Jesus on the cross has uh, indeed challenged our thinking. And as we all go through this difficult period of uh, lockdown uh, during this uh, COVID-19. Uh, and also we see how, uh, for instance, in India, the migrants have been treated. And for us in India, the lives of Dalits uh, could be uh, more or less related to uh, the lives of uh, uh, Black Americans. And the, the atrocities, the violence inflicted upon Black, I mean, Dalit bodies, uh, is uh, become everyday news that people fail to treat it as a human right issue because the, the familiarity or the over familiarity with the violence makes it as a very casual thing that could happen and that can go unnoticed or uninterrogated and mm -hmm. uh, unchallenged. Uh, so your presentation, I'm sure for Indian uh, New Testament scholars, as well as all of us who are, uh, who, uh, who are here in this uh, meeting, uh, could easily relate to. And uh, I'm sure there will be many questions, uh, many uh, critical comments that could be raised because you have really challenged us as Indian readers, Indian interpreters, Indian Dalit uh, interpreters, Indian women interpreters. Indian migrant interpreters to see how our life experiences could be interpolated into the biblical narrative. So thank you very much, Mitzi, for challenging our thinking this, uh, this time. Uh, I open this uh, time to, uh, for our friends to raise uh, questions and share your thoughts on what uh, Professor Mitzi has shared. You could uh, please uh, unmute yourself and raise the question. I see Helen has her. Um, 
Yeah. Hello. Um, hello, Dr. Mitzi. Thank you so much for your um, erudite lecture uh, uh, or presentation and um, the wonderful way that you have uh, connected um, the suffering of crucifixion with the uh, Black Lives Movement and um, uh, the abuse within the uh, uh, community. Um, especially the Black Americans, African American community. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for this powerful. And I, I don't have any question regarding what you have, what you have already said because uh, um, it was self-explanatory, it was relatable, it was contextual for us, and uh, we were able to. I personally was able to connect well with what you have uh, very clearly said. The only point that I was uh, wondering about and have been wondering about for the past. Four years ever since I've been, I have come to USA to do my PhD. Uh, right now, I'm doing my PhD in Hebrew Bible in the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. About the exegesis part, you know, the way you have uh, begun your presentation itself, and how biblical scholarship has been dominated by uh, the Western interpretation of uh, exegesis. Uh, mm -hmm. And how exegesis become, I mean, historical origins of the text becomes takes priority uh, over against the uh, over against prioritizing the lives of uh, individuals, the experiences of individuals, the artifacts of individuals, the and all these aspects, you know. And uh, I, for one, have struggled so much with regard to this because uh, being a biblical student, I've been informed by my uh, professors that. Um, um, biblical interpretation can only be possible with uh, historical criticism, critical methods. Uh, and I've been struggling ever since then because my professor told me uh, that if you want to talk about uh, Dalit women, if you want to talk about your experience of humiliation and shame, uh, better move to the theology department because uh, this is not the department for you. Uh, so having that experience, I'm just uh, wondering about uh, if there are any like support groups for you know, I mean, you might be you might you are in this field for quite a long time. So, are there any support groups for students like this who have come from different parts of the world uh, and continue to struggle? You know, uh, continue to struggle mm -hmm. with experiences such as these uh, and um, can probably never bring those voices even to their dissertation. And even mm -hmm. if they are, even if they bring those voices to their dissertation level will continue to face those kind of uh, limitations. So mm -hmm. my dissertation presentation, I mean, the proposal that I have presented uh, is about uh, intercaste marriages and uh, its connection with uh, Ezra Nehemiah text within the uh, Hebrew Bible. And I wanted to draw, surface and foreground the voices of uh, intercaste marriages and Dalit voices in India. And of course, as ex as expected, there is like pushback against this. And uh, you know, my teacher said that uh, you probably look for an inner biblical text uh, and do an inner biblical exegesis. Uh, so this is uh, such a struggle for me as I continue to you know uh, navigate through this process. And I'm just like asking you if there are any support groups for us to you know stay connected and uh, feel that uh, the work that we are doing. And the voices that we raise are important uh, and significant in the interpretation of the Bible itself. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you, Helen. Yeah, you know, that is a perennial problem. And, you know, I was talking to someone, somebody was um, uh, a colleague um, uh, 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 working on a new edited volume, and a colleague um, emailed me and he said, you know, you know, Harvard is looking for a New Testament full professor. I said, but they don't want me, I'm sure. And not that I, I don't think I could survive there either. I survived being a student there. I don't know if I could survive being a professor. It's, it's a crazy environment, uh, very oppressive in my view. But uh, yeah, my, my regret is not being able to, and most black scholars and most scholars of color are not able to mentor doctoral students, right? We are not at those institutions, even though I hear, I hear from doctor, doctoral students, you know, who will contact me for advice and so forth, but they're not my students. And so at some point I have to say, you have to speak to your, your professor, you have to go through your professor. Uh, but that's a great point, Helen. We need, we do need that organization. And perhaps this is that moment to start one. I don't know of one. 
I, I, I did a, dialogue, a, a Zoom dialogue where a woman out of Princeton Theological uh, Seminary uh, uh, um, asked the question, where can I get this mentoring that these men were claiming they got, right? And nobody had an answer, right? <laughs> you know, how, how do women of color get this mentoring? So uh, let's start one. <laughs> I'm serious. This is a this is a radical moment for this is a moment. This is a this is a watershed moment that we need to seize, right? So let's start one. I I I I let's let's start one. I'm serious. We're gonna start one. Uh, Andrew. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Mitz, for this uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation and. Uh, I'm uh, I'm talking to you from Vancouver. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, before you yeah. hold that for us, I want uh, something else I want to say in response to Helen said. So I, I I've only been in Georgia a year, and they have a New Testament group uh, from this area uh, sponsored by Emory, right? That uh, they come together about I think every two months, and somebody reads a paper, and people respond. And so I've only been able to attend because I had a Monday night class and they've been on Monday night recently and I attended one. You know, I said, okay, I'll present a paper. And every, you still struggle because I'm thinking, okay, this is primarily white, right? Um, and I, 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 I agreed to do a paper, to present a paper. And even at my level, I, I began to struggle with, do I want to deal with the crap I may have to deal with if I present what I normally present? And I, and I came to my conclusion this week, yes, I will. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. And I'll pray that I'll be ready to give the appropriate responses if I get any negative feedback. <laughs> okay, Andrew, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's okay, no problem. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm speaking from Vancouver, and then uh, so I'm with your time also, and uh, I am a student okay. at the University University of British Columbia, uh, mm -hmm. doing my ancient culture, religion, and ethnicity here. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Dr. Mitz. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my question is towards uh, the passage that you took up, uh, especially the Book of Acts, mm -hmm. and uh, when we go back to Acts chapter eight. Uh, uh, I'm so glad that you were in your context able to bring up the the slave community and the slave structure of the ancient world, ancient Roman world. Uh, the the question that I uh, uh, wanted to share with you is uh, uh, slaves also in the ancient world were uh, were in a very good position. You know, uh, when you when you when you read Acts chapter uh, eight. Uh, we see that the eunuch uh, is uh, mm -hmm. is uh, he he he's handling and managing the treasury of the of the queen. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one thing that we need to keep uh, because the text is talking about humiliation and also the justice and and the Old Testament scripture is brought about this. Now, the, the, the real question there, uh, I would think, and I want to pose is uh, for all of us is that uh, there are certain rights uh, that are denied to, the, to this kind of community, even in the church. So that is what is going on in this text, I would say. But when, when you look at Acts chapter eight, verse 36, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Mm -hmm. And so this is the struggle here is that the, that the, the institution of the church is, is uh, denying mm -hmm. uh, rituals, is denying uh, privileges mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. communities, to communities. Mm -hmm. And that is, the, that is the question here. That is what is happening here. And, uh, and so, so Philip becomes an institutional structure who is breaking uh, barriers of even circumcision and bringing, integrating this community into the body of Christ. Yeah, so, so you can look so how, how, how do you, how do you, how, that's what, that's the, that's the, that's the struggle here. The struggle is the, is the, is the church, is the, the church is getting, is denying rights. 
Oh yes, so there's a lot. It's very complex in, in Acts, right? So let me address the 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 the, the status dissonance of, of this that, that that he is uh, that he is a subordinate and he is um, uh, he has this stigma uh, this stigma of having been castrated, right? It is a stigma that, uh, and this type of stigma only allows you to go so far. The oppression remains, right? No matter his status. And we could think of Barack Obama, right? President Obama, he was not immune from the racism as president, right? Uh, and the pushback and the majority white men, Christian racists that controlled the House and the Senate, right? So, so that oppression, that, that, that stigma, that racism, you never get out from under it. Uh, if, if you are not the dominant, you know, it, it, you never get out from under it, right? Even with this status. And yes, so some slaves, yeah, because Rome valued um, um, trained slaves, right? If you proved that you would be a loyal, submissive slave, they would train you because they wanted you to make a lot of money for them, right? But you were, even when you, if you lived long enough to be freed, if you had a, 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 um, a master, right, uh, who wanted to free you, free you, you were still considered in a, in a very real way attached to that master, right? And you had you he he controlled any inheritance, any money that you got, right? He, your children could not get your inheritance if your master master was still alive and so forth. So you carry that stigma of that impression, right? So so it's complex. You still, you know, if you're still a slave, right? You still carry that stigma. You still are less than. I don't care, even if you're in Caesar's household working, you are still less than, right? So, uh, so when you talk about denying rights, this is complexity, right, in Acts, because Philip, uh, uh, Philip doesn't necessarily per se represent the power structures of the church, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is that 12 in Jerusalem. Right, those 12 in Jerusalem. Even when Philip goes down and he preaches, you know, then P Peter and John have to come down and, and lay hands on and take control and demonize some assignment, right? Uh, so uh, there are so many different ways you can read, and I don't want to deter you from reading that way. Yes, there are ritual, there are, the, the church does prevent people if, from many, in many ways from engaging in ritual and is very oppressive. Right, uh, so that is one way to read. It is a legitimate way to read, and it's a thing that needs to be read. The church needs to be taken into account. I just wrote an uh, essay that's on my um, for this um, um, uh, faculty online journal at my school called uh, "At This Point." Uh, this point uh, in response to slavery in the church, and one thing I say is, we cannot. We, 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 we cannot neglect the fact that the church is an institution. And as an institution, it is no better, no less sexist, no less racist than the people who control it. Right? Yes. So yes, that's a very, that's not only the only, the only way to read. And I, I, I think I like to be clear that there are always, I'm reading, I'm reading a way to read, right? I'm not going to be in the business of most dominant um, uh, voices, white male voices who want to say this is the way to read. No, this is a legitimate way to read. Your way is a legitimate way to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank you. that's a great response, uh, Mitzi, and great question, Andrew. We have Christy and uh, Joy uh, uh, have raised hands for questions. We'll take them, and if anyone else has, please share now. Hello. Yes, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, my camera is not working, so I think you may not be able to see me. I am Christy from Bangalore. I'm a pastor in a church. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Mitzi, thank you for those uh, insightful presentation, which was very relevant to relate with the today's context. As you began countering this uh, process of exegesis, you were locating 
the life world of black people as the center. Mm -hmm. And you said sacredness. And sacredness is something which is which is uh, contributing to the lives of the black or lives as sacred, sacred than a text. Mm -hmm. The moment when we speak about this aspect of sacred, the binary of secular comes in. So how do we deal with the binary of sacred, secular one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Secondly, how could this sacred respond to the politics of purity pollution when we relate from the lives of the Dalits and the women? So is it appropriate to locate sacred as the center of the life world of the black women? If it is so, how do we reinterpret this very aspect of sacred in politicizing what purity politics is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Christie. This is a, uh, these are important questions. And, and you know what I'm saying? We need to, we, we do need to reject, I think, this notion of these binaries, all of these binaries of, uh, um, because, uh, God, is, we create the binaries. I don't believe that God created the binary. God created everything and said it is good. It is sacred, right? But we create binaries. And uh, I think Western um, um, constructions of religion, religion is a, religion is a um, academic construct, right? Religion does not exist until academics created the idea of religion in order to examine religion, what they call religion, right? So let's say this is what religion looks like and then everything that fits into this rubric becomes religion and that's sacred. And sacred is one of those categories, right? Uh, so um, I think we need to get away from this notion of what is sacred and what is secular, right? Uh, everything is sacred. It doesn't mean that everything that's sacred is 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 infallible. No, uh, to be sacred is mean that it is valuable, uh, that it has value, um, um, that as God um, uh, created and as God um, intended, it is sacred. Yes, we can mar the sacred, uh, but everything. Uh, uh, is sacred. To say that black women is sacred doesn't mean that we are perfect. To say that life is sacred does not mean, mean it is perfect. Uh, I think to be human is the very definition of imperfection because we are not God. But we can still be sacred. We are still sacred. And so interesting the way we want to take a text uh, and, and somebody needs to examine, maybe I will, somebody needs to examine where did this idea of, of um, the infallibility of a text come in. And it came, it, it came in at a particular time in religious history with Protestantism, right? Um, and, and what was its purpose and what was its goal and who was it meant to subordinate? Who was it meant and what was it meant to, to oppress? Uh, so we need to get back to the idea that all life is sacred. All life is sacred. And that life does not have to be perfect to be sacred. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we need to, to, to think about how do we reinterpret that. And I think that's your job in your context, to reinterpret uh, uh, in light of the notions of purity and pollution, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not in your context. I can't interpret for you, uh, uh, so so I think that's that would be the job of, of your scholars to reinterpret that notion from your context and reject this notion of this this binary, reject it between the secular and the sacred. Mm -hmm. John, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. I, it's something related with uh, Helen's question also. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. You already started uh, what was in my mind also. Um, I am um, started my project, I mean, my research on ritual studies, and especially I'm focused on the body as a text. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking uh, no more the text is a resource for my, that's so I'm, I'm fighting for my, <laughs> that to say that. Thank you. Your thought also related with my. Um, 
uh, pipelines. And I have only one question regarding this academy. Um, how can we proceed? Like uh, you said, the body is uh, sacred, then the text. Um, the same thing also, I, I'm struggling like a Helen to justify my methodology in my university. Uh, my professor actually partly, I'm thankful that uh, they are agreed, they are in Amsterdam, so they are a little bit liberal than Germany. Actually, I'm in Germany. I mm -hmm. have a problem with my professor, that's why I left the university, so to say, mm -hmm. explain them. But if you do research in so-called branded or sacred universities, you are like qualified or seen something higher. For example, if I go to the person who agreed my methodology, who's in the university or something is not seen as sacred or highly regarded, it's something is a problem for the Dalit people. So we always try to pursue, that's my, my view. So we always wanted to go to the higher, the sacred universities or professors who can see, because we also wanted to be seen, no? That's so far, our academic knowledge is our experience is not, not accepted as mm -hmm. theirs. Mm -hmm. So we always go to this kind of professors, so to say, other academician in our publications to, uh, to be seen, mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. um, valued or to be seen, uh, so holy or in the other languages, so to say. How can we fight against this? Because it's so much in our mind, academic. When you call it, if somebody, you also, I think you studied in Harvard. So when I hear, I think, wow. So no, indirectly this, it's coming into my mind. Oh, she studied in Harvard. It is very, uh, for me, it's a honor. And then I say it's a very, very much appreciated. But how can we fight again this hierarchy between this academic uh, uh, institutions? or the publications, how can we find it? I, I don't know how we are dealing because you are you studied in a very um, uh, known university. Now you are telling us to be radical of this, but how can we fight? Because we are the beginners of uh, to fighting against or find the right person to um, justify our methodologies. So mm -hmm. what do you say, uh, what is your, it's, I am always uh, so critical of this uh, high five terminology. So, I'm, I done my PhD in this university under this professor, the white man, and who already determined the methodologies, what I have to do. So I have a problem with that. So how to deal with that as a Dalit women who are wanted to be radical like you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I understand you correctly. So, so is, there, is, is, there, is, is the thinking that because I went to Harvard, I'm able to be more radical? Is that the thinking? No, it's not the thinking. No, oh. I, I don't know how you you did um, with your. Can you able to do your methodology without your your so called professors or your mentor be radical? I can you fight oh, okay. against them? Yeah, yeah. So um, at, at Harvard, um, well, let me say it took me a while to find my voice, right? And had the courage to, which I found it, I, I was compelled, but compelled by what was going on in my community, finally woke up to, you know, what am I doing, right? Uh, at Harvard, my, 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 my main advisor, Professor Bovan, who is now deceased, was European, right? And he was, he was open in some ways. Uh, for example, when I TF'd for his class and, and he gave all of his TFs an opportunity to do a lecture, I did a lecture on womanist Christology. He had never heard of it, but he was open to me giving the lecture, right? But he also had very, very conservative views. And his colleague at the time, Alan Callahan, I was taking his class in African American hermeneutics at Harvard, right? And I remember Professor Bovan saying to me, "Well, what he does is hermeneutics," and I'm thinking, "It's your New Testament colleague. How are you separating what he's doing from, you know, and what he's calling theology?" And you know, so so that that's a continual fight, right? 
Um, and when I do when I do womanist interpretation, people want to call it hermeneutics, and so I'm pushing back. I'm pushing back when I'm publishing. No, I want to use the term interpretation. And uh, uh, so we have to push back when we when we are in a plate when we get to the place to do so. Right? When I did my dissertation, I didn't have anybody to encourage me to do what I'm doing. Right? He said somebody said. Well, why don't you challenge the um, uh, the continuity of Luke Acts? I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I may want to do it now, but or or why don't you write about the Jews and Acts? And that's what I did, even though I took a turn and, and talked about othering instead. You know, in my advice, he said he it, when he read the book, he said I didn't think this would this this would work, but you made it work, right? Uh, so we kind of have to. Uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the work happens. You have somebody willing to work with you, uh, um, and and that's why we need to push for people of color in these institutions, right? 